Hey, and welcome to Full Proof Theology. My name is Chase Davis, and I am your host here on Full Proof Theology. We really enjoy talking with people who are doing deep theological work, who are really going after theology in a foolproof manner, meaning uh, really not watered down. And um, and so I'm really excited to have our next guest here on the show. Today we're going to be talking with Jeff Metters. Jeff Metters is in Houston. He is the Equip Director at Risen Church in Houston, uh, where he lives with his wife Natalie and their two kids. And Jeff is the host of the Acts 29 podcast, which I'd, I'd encourage you to check out. He's having great guests on there all the time. And so I'm really excited to talk with Jeff today because Jeff is not only doing all of that, but he's also getting a PhD. So Jeff's a busy guy. He's got lots of responsibilities. And and I'm really excited for our conversation today on biblical spirituality. So Jeff, thanks so much for being on the show today. Uh, thanks, Chase. It's good to be here, man. Uh, grateful. Yeah, for sure. Uh, one of the things I wanted to start off with is I've been kind of following you for a while and um, we kind of briefly mentioned before we got on air, just kind of some of your church story. Right now, you're the Quip Director. Uh, I guess, yeah. first of all, you know, a lot of times in church world, we kind of make up these titles for ourselves. <laughs> what does an Equip Director do? Yeah, an Equip Director does a variety of things, uh, from helping organize our discipleship class system and spiritual formation and uh, stuff for residents, to also helping set up chairs and helping greet people and equipping people with coffee and equipping our, our pastors with, uh, you know, organizing something or, or whatever. So I'm just like any other staff member in the church who is serving in a, in one way and then preaching on Sunday and just doing a variety of stuff. But my main emphasis is on our classes and working with one of our pastors. So we have our own Institute, the risen Institute. And so I just mapped out the syllabus and, and the class for uh, our Christian story, which is kind of a biblical theology class. So I mapped that, mapped that out for this fall, put the calendar together. And so I, I do a lot of that stuff too. So, oh, man. And, yeah, it's so busy. And we have the risen collective. So I should mention that too. So we have um, a family of churches in the greater Houston area. And so I also work for the risen collective, helping to develop and encourage our pastors and, and our churches uh, there in the collective. So Risen Church, Risen Collective, X29, PhD, and sleep and writing, all of that. Just, you know, we're all busy and I'd rather be doing all this than doing nothing, than being really good at Call of Duty. Yeah, for sure. That's great, man. Uh, yeah, we're doing something similar at the well with the kind of family of churches. Did you ever read, um, what was the book by Greg Allison and Brad House? Yeah, uh, Multi Church. Yeah, what, uh, yeah. There's, there's several models in that book. Um, did you ever get to read that book and kind of figure out where yes. y'all are on the spectrum, so to speak? Yeah, yeah. We I I skimmed it recently. Uh, read read kind of the descriptions of of all of them. Uh, we actually our church just we brought in our collective brought in Greg and Brad just uh, back in May, and awesome. so we sat with them and asked questions. And so we're still having to tinker out like, okay, where are we on here? Some of the things we're we're you know got nailed down. Okay, this is good. Other stuff like, okay, we need to strengthen this up some more. So that's that's still in in process of what this is actually going to look like in in more full force. That's beautiful. Yeah, we we ended up naming ours the collaborative literally from that book uh, mm. because I think we were going to go with collective but uh we were trying to stick to the to the paradigm they suggested in the book. Um but that's really awesome that you get to do all that work. That's some of the similar work that I get to do at the well. And so uh, equipping people is really fun kind of yeah. planning out an institute. Did you happen to um take cues. I, I recently connected with JT English and he started yeah. the Village Institute. Yeah, are y'all doing something similar that they, they started yeah. there? Yeah, very similar. JT has been a good friend of mine for, I don't know, maybe three, four years. Um, helped me navigate some of my church transitions and stuff like that. But we actually just had JT at uh, Risen and he did a lecture for us on the Trinity and preached on Sunday morning. And so we just had some time to sit and talk. But yeah, the Village and Mason King um, and Jen Wilkin, of course, they've just been so helpful, I think, to so many churches on here's ways you can build this, here's ways you can think about it. And so if you know people are listening or interested in starting their own institute, you should go to trainingthechurch.com, just a free plug for the ministry that JT and Jen and Kyle Worley do, where they help churches figure out how to do an institute in their own environment, like how they can contextualize it, how they can do it in their way. Because the village is different. One, it's a mega church. It has a celebrity pastor who's a great brother and Matt Chandler that's in the sub in the suburbs. And so if you're an urban church, you know, you can't do it the same way the village does it. Uh, so they, they try to help you figure out the best way um, to do it for your context. So yeah, go to trainingthechurch.com and you can, you can check them out. That's great. Thanks for sharing that resource. Um, one of the interesting journeys that you've had is you, you're a former church planner now working for 
um, an established church. I guess it's yeah. a church plant. It's on, on its own. Um, how's that transition transition been for you? Yeah, man, I love it. So I, you know, if listeners aren't familiar with some of my story, I, I became a lead pastor of a dying church at 25 years old and I'm, I'm 36 now. So I was a part of the team that helped plant it. it this church was started out of a kind of the explosion and death of another church where the elders of this previous church had really uh, mismanaged some finances uh, really so significantly in the hundreds of thousands of dollars to where district attorneys were getting involved and all, all, all kinds of stuff. And so that church died and this other church just kind of started out of that rubble and we weren't trying to start a church, but it seemed like God was starting one without us. And so we really had to figure out how do you even start a church? You know, I'm like 22 years old, a group of us that were all there, like we have no idea. We're Googling, uh, finding, hearing about Ed Stetzer and then hearing about Acts 29 and so all this kinds of stuff. Well, the church plan is going okay uh, for the first two years. And, but really it wasn't really a church. There wasn't membership, there wasn't eldership, there wasn't deacons, it, there was no formalized stuff. It was, I, I likened it to just a big Bible study with child care and music on a Sunday morning. And so we had to make the changes. Um, the, really this temporary leadership team all kind of got together and said, okay, we either need to shut this thing down or we need to hire a lead pastor because mm -hmm. this is, this is nuts. And they interviewed about seven other guys. Um, no, nobody wanted to take on the sinking ship, but there I was at 25 and I just thought I'm feeling called to do this. I, let's give it a whirl. Let's give it a try. At first, they were hesitant, um, understandably so. And but no one else wanted the job, so it's like, hey, I'm the only guy here. So I was hired to be the lead pastor. Uh, God did a lot of remarkable things through through my time there. It was about ten years. I had actually wrote a ten year plan at 25 years old, uh, hoping that just by God's mercy that we could do these things in years one to three, and these things in years three to five, et cetera. And I was there for nine years and eleven months. Wow. Uh, yeah. And I, I resigned from there last year. Uh, you know, 2020 had all kinds of things happen for all kinds of people. There was just a, a lot of conflict, um, a lot of things that I tried to work through with, with a lot of people in the church. And at the end of the day, we worked through some, but at the end of the day, it was just like, this is best for me to go. Um, and so we, I left July last year and now I became a member at Risen Church, just the guys that I knew there. It's another great Acts 29 church. And so I just became a member, um, took some time off and through different, you know, offers coming in and like, man, what does God have next for our family? Like, where are we going? Are we moving? Like, well, God, what do you have next for us? Uh, God opened the doors and made it clear that, man, I can work in the church uh, for Risen and I can work for the church for Acts 29. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's just a dream. Um, just a dream situation to be working there in Risen Church and serving the body of Christ there. And then to also be working for Acts 29 and serve the church globally, I I feel like I've just tumbled into just a lush valley of blessings that I'm just, I'm really so grateful for. I, I can't believe it. So I, I'm so thankful. That's great, man. Yeah, that's so good to hear. And I'm so glad for where you've landed that that story. Uh, you know, I'm sure it's going to resonate with a lot of people. Uh, when, when we planted the well, I was 24 and I was doing the same thing. I was, Acts 21 was asking us, what's your order, ordo salutis? And I Googled that and then I filled it out and they were like, yeah. it sounds like you're Arminian. And I was like, ah, uh, shoot, uh -oh. I think that's bad, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so, yeah, I, I understand the, the kind of chaos. One of the books that really helped me um, was The Honest Guide to Church Planting. In fact, I read that in 2019. Okay. And I, I was just sitting in coffee shops crying, you know, people mm. thinking this, what's wrong with this person, you know, and, uh, and it just spoke so um, honestly about the pain, the struggle, the dynamics. Uh, one, one just a uh, plug from that book uh, is where he said that you'll eventually reach a point for normal church planners, not like mega church planners necessarily, Yeah, where you're going to meet more people in your town who used to go to your church than actually go to your church. Mm. And that just really helped articulate a sense of attention, a loss that yeah. I hadn't attended to. Uh, as I kind of see these people who it's like, why did they leave or what's going on? Or right. do they hate me? Is something wrong with me? All these questions that you inevitably have in ministry and leadership, not just in church, but in any kind of leadership. Um, but yeah, I just really found that that Good. helpful. But I'm really Good. glad that you've landed there. 
Oh, thank you, man. Uh, man, that's so true, Chase. I remember being 25, 26 and just being at the grocery store and people coming up and telling me like, oh, we used to go to the church you were at, uh, but we just thought you were too young. My husband just, I remember somebody like, my, my husband just couldn't respect you. And so we just decided to leave. I was like, oh, praise the Lord. That's great. Um, thank you for sharing that that last part. Uh, you know, I mean, so I, I think we do need to have more honest conversations about church planning and and the underbelly of church planning that comes with it. Um, the Apostle Paul does that uh, with Timothy. He tells him in Second Timothy, you know, you followed my teaching, and which we all know, yeah, we follow the apostolic doctrine. We're there, but he also tells Timothy, you followed my sufferings. Mm-hmm. Um, you followed my persecutions. So like he also opened up his life to Timothy and Timothy saw the scars. Timothy saw these things. So we've got to do a better job. And I think Acts 29 is now doing this about talking about the full, you know, like range of experiences and the full range of things that happened to you when when you plant a church, when you serve the Lord in this way. And so I'm happy to share those stories and and mentor guys and, and share kind of, you know, the ways that God has helped me um, and taught me like second Corinthians one talks about, you know, I was afflicted and, and suffered. And so I could be a comfort to others and that God has comforted me. And so that we can be a source of comfort to others. And so there, I wrote an article a few years back at for the church, um, website of ministry of Midwestern called pastoral PTSD. Mm-hmm. And that, that may be a help to some, I still get emails about it, even though it's like five, six years old about just that, man, we do struggle with this. And, and so guys could check that out if you're a pastor or even if you're a church member, you, you may be able to pop the hood and see some of the things that your pastor may, may struggle with. That's great. Thanks for sharing that resource. One of the interesting things through this journey of yours is um, you've kind of been on this track now to get a PhD. And so I yeah. wanted to talk about that because a lot of the content, at least on this podcast, uh, I, I just enjoy talking with people about kind of, uh, you know, being curious about God and what he's doing and how he works in the world. Uh, kind of what was the journey for you to, uh, pursue a PhD. Yeah. You know, I was always, um, I can remember being converted as a, as a kid in like elementary school and having, having interest in things of theology. And I, but I wouldn't have used those terms back then. I would hear things in church and I'd go ask my parents, uh, what is a Trinity? What, what does that mean? And, you know, my parents would be like, man, I, we'll get you a book. Uh, you know, it's like, I think our church has some booklets in the fellowship hall or something like, we'll get you one. And I just had this kind of desire of like, I want to learn, I want to study, I want to figure these things out. And I guess after being a lead pastor for a while and starting to write and, and, and things like that, I just had different friends come and approach me, guys who had finished their PhDs or, or guys that were almost done and saying, man, you should really consider this. And I just thought, no way no way I could do this. Uh, I'm not that kind of thinker. I'm not on that level. And they just really kept encouraging me. I said, you know what? And I had other friends and stuff at the church too, that more like closer in the orbit of my life than guys that, you know, are also friends, but were out there, you know, we didn't live in the same town, but other people that were saying, yeah, you should think about it. You should pursue it. I I think you could be, you know, you could be a, a doctoral student. You can do this. You've already written a book. You've shown you can write. It's just the grit. Do, will you have the grit and the stamina to, to go through it? I thought, all right, well, let's see if the Lord opens these doors. I mean, my son at the time, he was still at home. He wasn't in school yet. So I thought, okay, when he goes to kindergarten five days a week, hmm. then I'll apply. I'll, I'll check it out and I'll begin the process. And, and things just kept opening. Um, things kept happening. Uh, at Southern, at, at Southern Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. And I just thought, okay, Lord, I mean, I'll, I'll apply. I'll go to the interview, I'll do the entrance exam, I'll do all this stuff, and if I bomb, I'm okay. Uh, I'm I'm not gonna be upset. I'll be able to watch more Netflix and hang out with my wife at night, you know, like, sure. And if I make it, okay, Lord, let's do it. I, I'll, I'll go on this journey and whatever you have from that. Uh, so I went and I guess it was in, it was during, in 2020 when I went to Southern and had my interview there. Uh, and I remember going at the interview and it was like, the pandemic was just kind of starting. Like, like the NBA hasn't, hadn't been canceled yet. And I remember we were walking around, you know, there's no masks, there's no nothing. People are shaking hands and hugging and like, Hey, good to see you. And we're just kind of like, 
should we shake hands? And we're like, I think we're fine. And then, you know, man, I think it was almost a week later, like the world shut down. Wow. Uh, yeah, it was crazy. And so, you know, I heard during the pandemic, like, hey, you've been accepted. Um, you can begin this fall. And so it's been a wild ride. Um, I'm doing the biblical spirituality track and, uh, and Donald Whitney, Dr. Donald Whitney, mm. uh, he's my advisor. And so he's been a great friend and just a great colleague in terms of like academic world and just encouraging me, but also a great mentor um, and just pushing me and, and helping me think through all of these things. So there's so much to think through. So I'm just grateful for his insights and his, uh, his encouragement as a friend and also as an advisor too. So it's a blast, man. That's great, dude. Um, yeah, that, that sounds like a wild ride you've been on in the last 18 months. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, wow. yeah, <laughs> yeah like after resigning, after, after leaving the church that I was at, you know, I thought, okay, what am I going to do now? Yeah. Well, I was in PhD seminars within a month. So great. I, so you have I like, something to do. Yeah. Like, I mean, the Lord, I think just gave me something to put my mind and my heart into where I'm sitting in class with, uh, Dr. Jonathan Pennington, um, going through the beginning stages and just all this stuff. I, it was so great. Uh, so I love it. Every, you know, I'm, if you're, I'm sure like, I mean, you know, as you go through these things, you're just like, this is so brutal. And then the semester finishes and you're like, oh, I can do this. Okay. Yeah, I didn't totally. fail my paper. Like, that's great. And then you do it all again, you know, yep. again and again and again, and then you're done. So that's right. I'm a year, I'm a year in, I got three more years, one that's more great, year of yeah. seminars and then two years of writing. That's great. Um, did you do your uh, MDiv or MA at Southern? Yeah, I did my MA at Southern. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, one of the things I'm curious about to hear from you, um, and I don't know how much this will matter to our listeners that much, but the the American system and the European system. So right now I'm in the process of applying to a couple of European systems um, in England, particularly because I don't want to learn another language. And <laughs> uh, and so and I'm trying yeah, to study. I'm doing, I'm doing German right now. So good for you, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's brutal. I can um, I can say I can say some German real quick just to impress everybody. <laughs> Das Buch ist guten. Uh, so as you can probably tell, like that's the book I is know good. Exact, yeah, I yeah. know exactly what you said. That was that's easy. <laughs> so you, uh, you're doing the American system with, with the PhD at Southern in biblical spirituality. Is the capstone project a dissertation? Yeah. And then how long is the that dissertation supposed to be? I think it's supposed to be anywhere between 50,000 to 80,000 words. Okay. which you know is not gigantic right in terms of like books so like humble, humble calvinism my most recent book i think was around fifty thousand words okay um so like yeah i could do that and i have two years to write it oh pff, even more time i wrote yeah. humble calvinism in six months like like i've got more time oh well this is easy breezy you know that's great yeah so I, yeah the european model which is so it's so intriguing like there's no seminars right isn't no. it just no class time just all writing yeah yeah man that would have been great. I'm ready for it. <laughs> yeah. Because I did my MDiv and my THM, which is essentially 120 hours of credit um, at Denver. Okay. And, and so after that, after another, so, you know, your bachelor, typical bachelor's degree is 120. Yeah. And then those two were 120 levels of both master's and uh, doctoral level stuff. And I was just like, I don't ever want to go to class again. Like I, I love, like, I love learning. Yeah. It's not a matter of not loving learning, but like, I just want to write. Like, I just want somebody to supervise me, advise me and let me do my thing. I don't need yeah. to go to all this. Not that I don't need to learn, you know, but yeah, of course it, it's, it's a chore to manage all the syllabi and all the assignments and the papers. It's, yes. it's rewarding because you get feedback uh, more so than you do kind of in ministry. Sometimes you actually get a grade. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's awesome. So biblical spirituality uh, you know, it's a topic I'm very curious about. It's what my book and my, my thesis and hopefully my PhD will be on. How did you end up landing on that? You wrote a book on humble Calvinism, you're in ministry, applying to Southern. And then uh, what was it about biblical spirituality that you were yeah. like, I, I want to hang my hat in that area? Yeah. You know, what I love about biblical spirituality is that it does seem to be kind of the intersection or kind of the nexus or the fruit of multiple disciplines. That it is, I, I like to use the phrase, it's from Eugene Peterson, but it's not unique to him. A lot of people use it um, of spiritual theology. That it is, it's not altogether separate from like Christology or biblical theology or, or whatever, but it is kind of the integration of the, those doctrines with the life, with the experience of walking with God, of following God, of, of loving 
him, of learning about him and living for him. Like these things all happening, you know, simultaneously and feeding off of each other. Um, so that just seemed like that is the Christian life. That is the heartbeat of the Christian life. So, you know, and also in my mind, you know, I, I always make jokes when I'm at the PhD seminars. So I see like Old Testament guys, friends of mine that are in the Old Testament track. I'm like, oh, well, you guys are like the real PhD. I'm like a diet. I'm like a diluted PhD, you know, and then I'll make another joke to them. Like, well, we actually care about living our stuff. So, you you know, you guys can do it. So I, nice. I just think, yeah, I just think it is for me and kind of my emphasis and wh where I'm at in ministry and what I do, it just seemed to be just a great, a great fit and, and having a, a friendship with Dr. Whitney and having him at our church before, uh, then just, you know, it just seemed to really make sense. And when I looked at humble Calvinism and in my first book, gospel formed, they're kind of the exact same thing. Hmm. It's taking a doctrine and showing here's how it should change how you live. Here's how it should change your life. And so like humble Calvinism is kind of a work of biblical spirituality. It is a work of spiritual theology. How do the five points of Calvinism change your daily Christian life? How Absolutely. does it change? How does it change your piety? How does it change your spirituality? I think those are all words that they're all mean the same thing. Practical Christian life, piety that's kind of the john calvin reformed puritan word and spirituality is kind of resurging again but i like the word spirituality because it, it sounds cool too um it sounds it sounds like more intentional than just um how do you live the christian life i think it's just a real like condensed version of here's what we mean by spirituality because spirituality is everywhere yeah. and, and we want to have a biblical a word shaped um a word informed a word driven biblical driven spirituality yeah, absolutely. I, that's why I love it too. Uh, it's funny that it, Calvin's Institutes are typically thought of as a systematic when I personally view them as a, very, a book on Christian spirituality yeah. where, where he's taking these doctrines and showing how they should shape our lives, our understanding, apply to real life in the church and in society. So yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you. Yeah, there's, um, more, there's more on prayer and like there's, I think there's more on prayer, baptism, and like the daily Christian life than there is on predestination. Yeah. And so like just this past semester, so this is an insight, like how how insane some of the classes can be, just insanely difficult and challenging the seminars can be. So I had a seminar on, I had the, the way the program works at Southern, it's two seminars every semester usually, um, one colloquium, like a one day kind of, but tons of reading. I think this last semester, I think I had to read at least minimum required reading books, books that were assigned. I think it was like 40 books um, between my two seminars and my colloquium. And then that doesn't even include all the journal articles you read for research, all the other books I read for research. Um, but I had to write, uh, I had to read all of Calvin's Institutes, all 1500 pages. And the professor considered that to be one book yeah. out of the like other eight he assigned. And his thing was, you know, everybody quotes Calvin, yep. but how many people have actually read it? Like yep. read the, and he's like, so you're going to read it all. And I had to write a 20 page paper, like summarizing the spirituality of the institutes. And, you know, you see all that and you're just like, oh my goodness, how am I going to do this? And then you do it and you go, man, I'm glad I did that yeah. because now, now I have a 20 page document where I could get up and I could teach very, you know, high level, very 30,000 foot view of here are some of the big movements in the institutes. So yeah. it, it's so much fun. It's so great, man. I love it. As far as your emphasis in biblical spirituality, um, what is it, where, where are you kind of landing as far as either, whether it's a dissertation or research area, what, what's kind of the, the focus point, whether you describe yeah. it, um, you know, for me, when I was writing my book, it was an interplay between what I was for and what I was against. So I was writing kind of against a certain vi vision of spirituality and advocating for, and I was showing kind of an interconnected. How, how would you describe your kind of focus uh, area of research? Yeah, it's been, t it's been tough. It's been a journey. It started with, this is crazy. So I remember, you know, Donald Whitney was at my house maybe three, four years ago, and he just made a offhand comment and encouragement that it, all it was, he said, if you can ever find a complete set of Spurgeon's Metropolitan Tabernacle, buy it. I don't care how much it costs because you can't find them. Okay. A year goes by maybe, and I'm at this theological library in Houston that uh, this uh, godly Christian lawyer, he just has done very well, and he just blesses the city with this amazing library. It looks like Hogwarts. I mean, it's unbelievable. It's all free. And I'm there, and I'm actually meeting with the director of the library, 
And he says, well, I have to go. I'm meeting this widow who's donating all of her husband's books uh, to the library. And I said, oh, well, if you see something you don't want, let me know. You know, just joking with him. He goes, well, what do you want? And then it was like Don Whitney's voice popped into the back of my head. If you find a complete set, you know, so I said, well, a complete set of Metropolitan Tabernacle would be great. And he goes, she has one. He said, we already have one. We don't need it. Uh, we don't need two. We don't need 120 volumes of Spurgeon here. Um, so well, how much do you want to pay for it? I just said, man, I, I have no idea. I, I can't come up with a price. I don't want to fleece some widow. Right, yeah. Like Whatever she wants to sell them for, I'll, I'll buy them. Just let me know. A couple months go by. I don't hear anything. And I just thought, eh, whatever. But I remember making a comment to my wife on the beach. Who knows? This may not fit. Maybe you can correct me, Chase. If this is not fit in within the spectrum of biblical spirituality, um, I told my wife, I was like, you know, if I get this set of Metropolitan Tabernacle, I'm going to take that as a sign from the Lord that I should pursue my PhD in biblical spirituality. And I get an email, I think it was like within that week, I'm sitting on the beach in Miami at an X29 uh, global gathering or pastor's retreat. And the email said, hey, she, I talked to the widow. She'd love to sell it to you. She's figured out a price. How about $300 for the whole set? Which, if you go on eBay, it's like two thousand yeah. dollars to try try to buy this whole set. Yeah, and I said, "Yep, for sure, I'm 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 in. I'll 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 buy those." And he delivered them. I mean, it was just insane. So that that's, that's awesome. so that is kind of like a kernel of part of the journey and part of the research, like emphasis. Okay, like should I do okay. something on 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 Spurgeon? And I'm you know Spurgeon's really popular right now and a lot of i have a lot of friends who have studied spurgeon i can think of nathan rose at midwestern seminary he did a great dissertation on uh the prince of preachers and the prince of darkness mm -hmm. uh, spurgeon's view of demons and satan and, and all this kind of stuff so i've read some of it it's very very cool and when i was applying uh me and another brother uh he was also i mean same same week that we were there he was also wanting to do spurgeon so i started wanting to do spurgeon how spurgeon preached the risen christ okay and man and I heard he was going to do Spurgeon, and I thought, man, maybe I should diversify here. And sure. I heard like a couple other guys are doing Spurgeon. I was like, man, Spurgeon's really popular. I'm going to pivot. And so I pivoted to Eugene Peterson. Okay. I, was like, I was like, this would be interesting to kind of try to trace the how the how the risen Christ informed Peterson's spirituality. He writes a lot about that, and I'm I'm obsessed with the resurrection, and really in preaching, it's kind of a joke throughout Acts 29 circles that. Jeff's the resurrection guy because I do like a lot of preaching assessments. And if guys' sermons are not, you know, a lot of guys will only preach the cross, which is wonderful. But if you don't tell me Jesus rose from the dead, well, then what are we doing? Like this, that's only half the story. That's the fact that Jesus is not a pile of bone dust somewhere in Jerusalem is why we have hope, is why your church exists, why mine does, why this podcast exists. I mean, the risen Christ is everything. And, and so that's just kind of been like a huge driver for me for about 10 years. And so as I'm sitting there, I was like, okay, I'll, I'll study Peterson and how he does the resurrection. And as, you know, just as seminars have progressed and different conversations and stuff come up, you go, you know what? I, it'd be cool to study Peterson, but which one would help my academic career more in my writing to do kind of a larger retrieval project of the risen Christ, beginning mm -hmm. with patristics and medieval era, and then going to reformation and Puritan and modern day. Um, would it, you know, would it be better for me to be able to win a Peterson trivia night or to, you know, know a lot about the risen Christ throughout, throughout church history. Mm. And so, yeah, so I, I pivoted, I met with Dr. Whitney and talked to the head of the department. I was like, Hey, you know, here's kind of what I'm thinking. And they know that I just, I love how the risen Christ himself should shape our spiritual lives and give us hope. And I, I just had written a paper last year about the uh, counseling issues, theological hermeneutics in the care of people with Dr. Jeremy Pierre. Mm -hmm. It's outstanding seminar. And he wanted you to take a doctrine, take a theology, and then take a counseling issue and collide them. Like, how would you counsel that issue with that theology specifically? And so I picked the risen Christ with depression. And so to sit and think for 30 pages about how knowing Christ is risen from the dead, how that shapes our, our view of depression, how that gives hope, um, so I'm just constantly thinking about how the fact knowing that Jesus is alive right now, um, not so much that Easter event, but that he is risen and ascended and is the Lord. Like, how does that impact everything in our life? And I, I think it's, I think it is the common denominator throughout everything in the Christian life now. So there's so much there to think through. So, so long story, um, how, what I'm hoping to do now, especially cause I just finished it this other semester, like reading a ton about how the Song of Solomon has just been 
a huge driver of of spiritual affection and the Puritans and in the further Reformation in the 16th, 17th century era, and how guys were quoting just Bernard of Clairvaux, a medieval uh, monk, uh, like crazy. I mean, Calvin, Calvin quotes Bernard of Clairvaux all the time. Uh, Spurgeon quotes Bernard of Clairvaux all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, these guys in the 17th century further Reformation guys, right? I mean, just one generation after the reformers, they're quoting Bernard, they're quoting Song of Solomon all the time and not in the ways that our 21st century evangelicals handle Song of Solomon, but in the ways the patristics did as being all about Christ and his church, um, all about Christ's love for his, for his people. And so I'm sitting here thinking, okay, maybe this should be my dissertation on the, on the contemplative enjoyment of the risen Christ in, you know, throughout church history. So they tried to retrieve some of that and how this really spiritual interpretation of the Song of Solomon should be traced in, in our own lives, but tracing it through the reformed and Calvinistic voices like Puritans. I mean, I have an Evernote file right on my screen next to me of all the times I can see Thomas Goodwin uh, referencing the canticles, referencing the Song of Solomon, and mm -hmm. it just blows me away. It mm -hmm. blows me away. So that's where I'm hoping it'll lead um, and some bigger projects coming out of that in my mind that that I, I don't want to spill the beans on yet, but a, a multi-volume book project kind of that would be in this in this, in this this vein. So we'll see. That's great. The the interesting thing about that is Song of Solomon. It's it's often perplexing to uh, to Christians. I mean, I, I remember growing up in in the church, and you know, as a middle school boy, you're like reading that, and you're like, oh man, I shouldn't be looking at this. <laughs> right, and so right. we we don't really know how to understand it. Um, just help me understand at, uh, from from your research when you're reading these guys on that book particularly. Are they going just straight allegorical, or are they honoring kind of the the nature of the text being yeah. between a man and a woman. How are they kind of going up that ladder? How far up the ladder of abstraction are they going on the yeah. text? Yeah, I mean, if you go back to the beginning uh, with origin, it's pretty much gonna be all straight allegorical. I haven't done a lot of work in origin, but I did read all of Nissa's and I wrote a paper on all of Gregory of Nissa's homilies on the Song of Solomon. Okay, And man, I really can't remember a single that may, may be there and I missed it. I can't remember a single instance where he gave like a practical homiletical counsel towards a husband and wife or anything like that. It was probably 99.9% .9 all Christ in the church. Okay. And I found a lot of times it to be incredibly edifying mm. and just in, incredibly encouraging uh, for my own soul. And there were a couple of times where I remember thinking, Ooh, that's kind of a stretch. But then there were other times where he's making intercanonical connections where he's like, this is, you know, we see this in the New Testament. We see Paul speak this way. We we see this here. And I was actually reading Song of Solomon yesterday. And there's a part, I think it's in chapter two, where she says, you know, I'm on my bed at night and I'm thinking of my, of my, uh, my, my bridegroom. Where is he? Where is he? And she gets up in the streets and she's looking for him. And then she, the watchman of the city finds her and she says, where, where have you taken my, my groom? Where have you taken him? And I was sitting there reading that, and I go, this sounds a lot like Mary Magdalene on the resurrection morning when she's talking to the gardener who ends up being Christ. Where have you taken him? Where is he? Mm -hmm. And so I wrote that in the margin, just like, man, this sounds a lot like um, this sounds a lot like the gardener. And then I'm reading yesterday in Thomas Goodwin, and he said the exact same thing. Love it. And so I saw it in the morning. Thomas Goodwin said it in the afternoon, and I thought, okay, well, I'm not far off. Sure. And And so I think there will be oftentimes a lot of allegory and i also think there'll be times where guys are making just these kind of a another sense like oh this is reminding me of this or, or, or we see this here and i think that's valid I, I think that's important and and michael haken who's a professor at southern and, and a lot of other places as well he's a very very busy man he made a statement in one of our seminars that song of solomon pre-enlightenment that is the book of the bible that had the most commentaries written on it hmm that there, there should be something to that and that we shouldn't dismiss, you know, right out like, oh, that's a crazy way to view Song of Solomon. Well, like the majority of our church's history has read Song of Solomon that way. And it makes sense because, you know, we believe Second Timothy 3.16, all scripture is profitable. Well, we have to be able to read Song of Solomon in a way that's profitable for a middle school boy. That's profitable for a single mom. That's profitable for a widow that's profitable for a quadriplegic war veteran. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Like, like it has to be more than some kind of Christian Kama Sutra. Sure. Like to really be beneficial for our spiritual lives. I think it is to see it. It's truly d- and deeply renewing to see that this is Christ's love for his people. And so I'll give you an example. So Greg Grivnessa, he says, um, and I, I was wondering how he was going to handle this because you get to the point of Song of Solomon where he starts naming different parts of her body, her eyes, her neck, her navel, her belly, you know, on and on. I thought, well, man, how is he going to make this about Christ in his church? Mm. And I, I'll summarize his comment. Nissa basically says, in the way that the the bridegroom, Solomon, is paying attention to individual parts of her body, that is how Christ honors and dignifies every individual member of his body. That, yeah, that Jesus loves every member of his church and gives you honor, gives you attention, gives you dignity, and says, like, how lovely you are. And I just sat back from my table. I was like, Oh, come on. Like, this is amazing. Uh, Just to have that sense and that awareness. And so I I think some of our problems with song of Solomon is that we have, we live in such a overly sexualized culture Mm -hmm. and, and American culture, global culture. Yes. But I think also evangelical culture. Um, There is kind of this, what we are over sexualized in our interpretations and we are D D Christo aroma sized in our view, views of the scripture. We just don't see the aroma of Christ in these things because we're immediately thinking, how can I benefit sexually from this? Um, that I, this is the most important thing to come at in this passage. It, it, it's not, it's, it's the second most important thing to arrive at mm-hmm. in any passage. Um, the first is Christ and how should we enjoy him? How should we worship him, glorify him, exalt him? And so, I mean, I could go for a long time on, on, on Song of Psalm and, and I'm just, you know, a few months in into thinking about it more and meditating on it more and just seeing how different writers have approached it. Um, I think we can do better than our 21st century approach to Song of Solomon. Absolutely. I, you know, there's kind of this joke uh, that at least used to be common where the, uh, the pastor gets up and talks about a smoking hot wife and, right. uh, and I even recently there's been some, some podcasts clipping former pastors saying things from Song of Solomon about how husbands and wives should uh, interact in the bedroom and that kind of thing. And, right. um, you know, pastors, I don't know what their role is in that necessarily, I guess in, in a counseling session, it, it's important that pastors at least have some wisdom to offer sometimes always pointing back to Christ, but kind of this crassness and uh, uh, of how we speak of women or how we speak of even ourselves as men and our sexuality. Um, it's just, it, it's poor stewardship. That's not to say there's not a place for, or at least in, in my perspective, for, yeah. for, for jokes or for humor or for, for instruction. But, but just there was kind of this permeation. I don't know if it was a reaction against kind of a prudishness because there, there was a prudishness, at least when I was growing up, uh, about these topics, but right. uh, you know, it seemed like an overreaction, at least where you've got a pastor up on top of his church with his wife, you know, yeah. and, and they're yeah. like challenging their church to do this like thing every day. And you're like, man, like, is this what church spirituality is supposed to be about? Cause right. it doesn't yeah. feel like it. Um, yeah. Yeah. It would be interesting to do a study to see how I, I've done it at all or anything, but it makes me think, wonder, like, I wonder how Augustine would view song of Solomon. And I'm sure it's out there and how he would think about a pastor on top of this is church's building and the mattress with his wife would be like, it, you know, it's kind of like the same thing. Our culture knows two things sell like crazy sex and war, sex and violence, sex and, you know, battles and all these kinds of things. And I, and I think some of it is kind of the same thing happens in the church too. We, we see people that build their ministries off of, off of war. They build their ministries off of always fighting something. They build their ministries off of fear mongering and propaganda. Um, I actually just read this morning in Psalm 120, uh, where the psalmist says, I, when I speak, I'm for peace. And I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. That there are some people, their, their attitude is, you know, I'm trying to build up. I'm trying to pursue reconciliation. I'm trying to do what brings healing. And there's other people, all they want is the fight. All they want is the war. All they want is the bloodshed. Because that will garner attention. And I think it's the same. So you have that. That's why, you know, war video games are so popular. And, you know, some of them are a lot of fun. I've played them with my kids. And then you have the other one. Well, that's why I remember Russell Moore wrote an article about this a long time ago about fake love and fake war, why pornography and why video games are are so popular. Mm. Because it is trying to harness 
those kind of instincts that that we have um that have been perverted in, in many ways too and so i think sometimes i think our over sexualized approach to the scriptures is a reaction to some of that prudishness that you've highlighted that yeah there are pockets of christianity and throughout church history where people have said you know that god's gift of sex isn't sh it shouldn't even be viewed as a gift that it's nasty that it's just for procreation well that all of those are are wrong and things that we should correct and speak positively and speak god glorifyingly about romance and and what god has given us um with our bodies but not to these degrees that are just so inappropriate um that we shouldn't we we shouldn't speak any more in any of those levels in the way the bible does um we should stay within the, the framework of the biblical language like because we're not professional therapists we're, we're you know like i'm not a i'm not a marriage therapist i'm like i can't give you that i can give you what the bible says you know for sure you know kind of riffing off that uh concept of war and sex um i have a theory i wanted to float by you as someone who's also kind of doing history uh theological retrieval biblical spirituality my theory is this is that because spirituality in the 20th century um, and, and going back to even the, the 19th century, um, and you could even say the modern era, was, was always attached to the immaterial, this, this kind of Gnostic notion where uh, what piety and spirituality has to do with is disconnected from material reality. Right. What I, I view our culture latching on to war and sex as a, uh, a bad preaching and bad teaching from the church because we've so neglected to properly attend to those realities of 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 just human uh material world the, the created order because there is a reality in which god created sex it's a powerful thing that god made yeah. and and if we don't speak in a powerful way about it in biblical way about it if we just reduce it to well you know we shouldn't we shouldn't enjoy it too much otherwise it may become a god um man we're really not equipping people that helpfully same thing right. with war. um because i think i've been wrestling with this because man like i can be uh you can call it combative hopefully not pugnacious um but i can just be i i was so imbued with kind of a pacifistic engagement with the world around me and it really allowed me to kind of stand apart uh, from fighting and look down on everyone else and mm. say, look, I'm not going to get my hands dirty because, you know, you guys don't want peace. Right. And I wonder how much of it has to do with the church's neglect to properly talk about Joshua and, and these Old Testament books where warfare is a central component of, of God going forth. Yeah. And even in resurrection, treading out the wine press, these, these violent images of our conquering king and and you know there's been some pastors who have abused those images to to take on an authoritarian bent right. in their ministry so uh, i'm not suggesting that's helpful but but i wonder how much of our society's obsession with these what whatever russell moore wrote uh, about how those two things particularly yeah are so heightened it's almost because we the church not to this isn't bashing on the church but but historically in the last 300 years we've neglected to attend to those uh, topics in a biblically uh, helpful way. Is that, yep. is that resonating yeah. at all? With you? I, absolutely. I, I think, you know, Greg Allison, uh, he just came out with a new book called On Embodiment um, and how, you know, I, I think you can trace a lot of this back to the enlightenment where, you know, Rene Descartes, he comes up with a solution of, I think, therefore I am, mm -hmm. where thinking um, the immaterial is the highest value and solution. Um, and that will give you comfort. And so we see this in the evangelical church, give people good doctrine, they'll be fine. Right. Well, that's not, that's not always the case. That's not how these things work. Um, we are embodied creatures. Uh, so there are other things at play than just our thinking. And I, I, I think James K.A. Smith addresses this so well in his first volume of cultural liturgies. I think it's desiring the kingdom where he really pinpoints this, that we are not just primarily thinking beings. We are loving beings. And so like we have to have formation of the whole person, of the heart, the, the body, the mind, the soul, like all, all of these things come together. Um, and so I think that is a lot of why some of our issues are, well, we'll just tell people the right thing and they should, well, no, 
every Christian that's been anybody that's been a Christian longer than, you know, six months or whatever, and a Christian that goes and commits adultery, they know this is a sin. Right. They know, oh yeah, this is wrong. So why do they do it? Well, it's because we're not just thinking beings. There's stuff in our affections. There are things that drive us. There are things in, in our hearts and our spiritual lives that are more than just our intellectual knowledge. Um, and so we, I think the church has to do a better job at addressing the whole person. And so I think it's Dr. Allison in his book, he talks about you know counseling a young man and he's asking him, okay, are you sleeping? Tell me, tell me about your sleep habits. Right. Tell me what you've been eating lately. And the guy's kind of frustrated by all this. He's like, I came here for spiritual advice. He's like, this is. That's right. Like, you know, this is the whole, the whole person. Um, and, and so I think some of our, like you had said, some of our Gnostic understandings of like material is bad. We just focus on right thinking, right believing. Well, that's not enough. And we see that in Galatians. You know, Ray Orland does such a good job of pointing this out in his book, The Gospel, a little green book from, from Crossway in the Nine Mark series, where he points out how, you know, Peter, when he leaves the table of Gentiles and goes, because, you know, certain men of Judea or certain Judaizers or whatever have, have come in, he, he points out that Peter didn't even teach a wrong doctrine, but he lived it wrongly. And Paul corrects him saying, you are out of step with the gospel, mm-hmm. not because of anything Peter said, but because how Peter embodied it, but because of how Peter lived it. And so that we've got to connect the dots here and see that it's not just the things that we say. It's not just the things we say we believe. It's not just our affirmations and denials. It's our actions and our affections of these things too. And so, so that really, I think, encompasses like a full biblical spirituality it is all of those things. And so I'd recommend, you know, listeners that are interested, like, man, this is kind of interesting, is to go get the book. Uh, it's edited, edited by Christopher Morgan. It's called Biblical Spirituality. And it addresses just almost every topic you could think of. And Dr. Allison actually has a chapter in that book on spirituality of the body um, and how really we just got to think intentionally uh, and in all these different ways. And so Chase, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head and that we've got to do a better job of thinking holistically and, and not just, am I checking the right doctrinal boxes? For sure. Yeah. You're, it sounds like you're going to love my book uh, when you read it. Uh, I think you got a copy of it because I, yes. I engaged Smith on that topic because uh, I, I agree uh, wholeheartedly with what you're articulating on this podcast about that. Um, kind of a closing thought on that, kind of riffing off what you said is, I think one of the important things we need to teach people is how to fight well. Um, yeah. Because what, at least what I'm hearing as I try to fight for, for almost the first time in the last year or so is stop it. And what men need to be trained on is how to fight well. And for right. most of our spirituality, it's fall in line, be nice, shut up, don't just dis- don't disrupt. And it's like, I, d- I don't think that's going to be helpful or, yeah. or faithful. Now, of course, like you already mentioned, peace, we should want peace. And also, if we're, we, the church, aren't leading the way and fighting well, then, then we're, uh, we're misstewarding the resources God has given us. Yeah. Um, and so that's just been something I've been trying to wrestle with because this fighting well, it goes back to that embodied spirituality. It actually means that sometimes I have to step out in faith and, and do things or say things before I know completely the right way to do it. And that's yeah. how learning happens. Sometimes. Absolutely. That means we have to be receptive to the spirit, receptive to other brothers in Christ. But we can't just sit on our heels and wait until we've figured it all out up here yeah. before we act. We have to walk in obedience. That's good. Yeah, like I think, yeah, I would never say, yeah, hey, we don't fight. You know, right. like, you, to be truly spiritual is we're just going to be all at peace and, and kumbaya. Well, like that, that's false peace. That's, 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 not real, that's not real peace. That's fear. Because um, what we have in Galatians, I think it's Rodney Reeves who, who says this in his book, uh, Pauline Spirituality or Spirituality According to Paul. That what Paul is doing in Galatians, he's not even just battling false ideas or false theologies. He's battling false spirituality, mm. false ways of loving God and false ways of loving neighbor. And Paul, I mean, Paul attacks it ruthlessly in, in the book of Galatians. And so I think part of our issue is, especially I think, you know, younger pastors and younger Christians, I think, you know, you and I could probably both say, yeah, we were there. When we carry a hammer, we think we're Luther and we think every we think everything's a Wittenberg door. Sure. Uh, you know, but like, okay, we're not Luther. Not everything we're battling here is not like 
to that level of 1517 Reformation. Some of these things are Titus issues. Some of these things are uh, Timothy issues. Some of these are maybe First Thessalonians issues. Like we're just helping people with their end times. Uh, some of this is Galatians issues. Like, whoa, this is compromising the gospel. Right. Some of, some of our issues are Corinth issues. Okay, we're not at unity of how to view this. Or this is some, uh, you know, some perverse, you know, sexually immoral activity that we've got to rebuke. Um, but all these things are handled differently. And, you know, I think it's in one of the Thessalonian letters where he says, you know, rebuke this person, be patient with this person, uh, that there are just different approaches for, for different situations. And I think pastors and leaders and writers and authors, we get in trouble when we just kind of flatline that. Yeah. And we make, we approach every issue the same. Um, especially without what Paul says, you know, rebuke enemies, even with gentleness and that. So we fight and we argue and we, we put our flag in the ground and say, no, no, this is the truth. Um, but we do it kindly and, and do it winsomely, um, attacking the ideology, attacking that false doctrine, not the person, not making ad hominem arguments, not trying to tear down the person and, and not name call. I mean, we know all the cheap ways of of getting the crowd to cheer like we're in a roman coliseum sure um instead of actually dealing with the ideas and, and what's being said and so yeah to fight well i mean newton has so much great stuff on, on how to argue well john newton yeah. um it's just incredible so i'm, I'm with you man there, there's got to be a way to do it that's going to honor the person and honor god as well for sure for sure one of my favorite twitter accounts is the insult uh luther insult me oh, yeah. generator because <laughs> so he he was like a bull in a china shop man with his uh the yeah. way he would phrase things, you're just like, okay, wow, you know, that's yeah. really, really out there, man. Yeah, he would talk about, you know, talking about like the Pope and telling him like to smell his farts and all. all this <laughs> yeah. stuff. I mean, he would get canceled within a week. Uh, to, totally. Today. He, he, there's no way he could have made it in today's culture. There's impossible. Totally. Well, Jeff, this has been such a fun conversation. I think we could keep talking for another hour just on all the stuff. We kind of have overlapping interests in a lot of ways. But thank you so much for being here as a guest on the podcast today. If people wanted to find out more about you, what are some uh, good places they can go to either to get a resource or to check out what you're doing? Oh, yeah. Well, thank man. First, thanks for inviting me. It's, it's great to, to be on Foolproof Theology. Uh, I love the logo and, and uh, the way you are after here. So I think it's great. Um, yeah, you can just follow me on Twitter. That's my most active place, just at Mr. Metters. You can, you can find me there. Um, also, you can go to spiritualtheology.net. Um, that's my little writing hub and home where I write about spirituality. And you can sign up for my Substack because everybody and their grandma has a Substack going on right now. And so if your grandma has a Substack, send it to me. I, I'd love to subscribe <laughs> and, and see what she, what she's writing about. Uh, so you can see, I mean, I write about all kinds of different things in spiritual life. And I just wrote a piece on the spirituality of quitting, like when it's time to quit things for our discipleship with Christ. How, how do we navigate that and think about it? Um, and then you can also find links to my books, as you've mentioned, Humble Calvinism and uh, Gospel Formed. And then a book I wrote a few years ago, co-wrote with uh, Brandon Smith, a professor at Cedarville, uh, called Rooted uh, Theology for Growing Christians. It's a really entry level, super easy read on um, on how theology grows us and shapes us and forms us. Um, so yeah, so you can follow me there. I'm also on Instagram. I'm, I'm almost never on Facebook, so don't even bother uh, sending me stuff on Facebook. I'm on there like maybe once a week. I skim it and then I go, why am I here? And, Good for and, you. I, and then I leave it. Yeah. That's great. The secret is to not have Facebook app on your phone. Yeah. That's what I've discovered yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah. It can be hard to do. Well, thanks so much for being on the show. Uh, if you enjoyed this this podcast, I'd love it if you would share this episode with somebody you know. Uh, my heart behind the podcast is to get people curious about God, to know more about Him, to love Him more, to love others. And so maybe you can start a conversation with somebody. But go ahead and like uh, the podcast, subscribe to it on YouTube if you're watching there. And until then, we will see you next time. Mm -hmm.